Kıymetli Hazirun, Efendim toplantımıza hoş geldiniz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Tasavvuf Araştırmaları Yaz Seminerleri başlığıyla düzenlemiş olduğumuz bu panel aslında yıllardır ümit edilen, üzerinde düşünülen, çok arzu edilen bir hayalin parçası oldu. Efendim bu panellerimiz inşallah 22'sinde bu ayın ve 29'unda da devam edecek şekilde 16-29 Temmuz 2018 Efendim Üsküdar Üniversitesi Tasavvuf Araştırmaları Üsküdar University Tasavvuf Research Center Intensive Summer Course And this very seminar is organized as open to public. We are all very excited. Uh, our rector was very eager to be with us. However, he couldn't actually finish up his programs in the hospital, so he sent us a message. And um, he actually kindly asked us to start the program without delaying our distinguished guests. The program goes like this. First of all, we are a bit late, so we are all very sorry. It's a meeting of friends, of dosts. Thank God. Uh, they have reunited. So this is uh, kind of overcoming the excitement of such reunion. That's why we start a bit late and we ask for forgiveness. I would like to thank you all for coming again. We have a few notes to make and then I will cut it short and uh, b I will talk about the significance of the meeting and um, I would like to thank for those who have actually accepted our invitations. Uh, these are precious scholars, professors, and we would like to welcome them and we would like to thank for their presence here. First of all, I would really true heartedly uh, express my gratitude and uh, we owe this to her vision. Thank you so much. Our precious rector, Nevzat Tarhan, uh, is heart to, to heart with us. So this has been a dream that is being realized right now and we are so lucky to be able to witness this true reality. This summer school will of course Uh, collaborating with Kerim Foundation and I would like to thank all the members of Kerim Foundation uh, especially to Emine Bal who is also the director of the Ankara branch of Turkish Women's Cultural Association and the board trustees as well so I would like to thank all my colleagues, Bergen Batum, who is the coordinator of the organization. Of course, uh, these uh, delegates were also present here with us in the morning, and they are also with us especially the, one of the founders of Kerim Foundation, Kerim Gitch, was also with us. He is one of the board members and he is one of the electrical engineers of our uh, community. And Can Güzel, Zülfikar Güner is also one of our professors who will be presenting. Uh, seminar, our professors will be talking about shortly, uh, but at the same time, we will also be holding uh, textual analysis of 
some Ottoman texts because our institute is also focusing on reading Ottoman texts and one of the themes is the Tasawuf texts during the Ottoman era. Of course, the Ottoman Turkish is now being in the foreground and this is one of our um, focuses. And in this field, uh, our professor who is an expert in Tasawuf literature is with us as well. So she will be actually working and teaching together with Professor Muhammad Bidirhan. So I would like to again extend my deepest thanks to all of you, especially to those who have come from outside of Turkey. I would like to mention them one by one. Carl Ernst and James Morris, our beloved teacher, very precious to us. And Judith Ernst, who has not left us alone. She's a distinguished artist at the same time precious wife of Carl Ernst. Thank you so much. I mean, we are speechless. We cannot thank you enough uh, because of your presence. And I would like to also thank the students who come from outside, from our own students, and since they have continued their trust in us, we are so pleased. Uh, so much thanks could be actually a bit uh, boring for you, so I won't. I will cut it short and we'll leave the platform to our uh, distinguished scholars. So the coordinator of the summer school, John Guzaz, will be uh, presenting now our speakers. Thank you so much. Merhaba to you all. Hi to you all. Uh, <laughs> the song of things translators will be, should be happy because I will be translating the first part. I have the honor to be able to be with Carl Ernst since to, for a long time. So, as a student at Harvard University, he obtained his PhD degree in 1981. Professor Ernst, in 1981 to 1992, uh, uh, was a lecturer at Pomona College and now uh, at uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina University. Uh, he is a professor uh, and adjunct faculty. And in his studies, he concentrates on West uh, and uh, South Asia uh, and concentrates uh, on activities and has many articles published. Uh, Islamic studies, uh, general and critical issues, uh, pre-modernity and uh, current uh, uh, Sufism and Indian Muslim culture are of his fields of concentration for studies. Rethinking uh, Muhammad, uh, following Muhammad, Rethinking uh, Islam in the Contemporary World uh, is a book uh, he uh, authored. In 2005, he was uh, awarded uh, with uh, uh, the service for Islam. In 2009, at Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina University, uh, on behalf of the Religious Studies Department, uh, with uh, Kenan Refai's uh, Islam uh, Studies uh, Department, he took active role for foundation, uh, World of Exorcism in Sufism, uh, Eternal Garden Mysticism, uh, and Politics uh, at the South Asian uh, Sufi Center. Our office uh, studies mystical experience and the rhetoric of Saint Jude in Persian Sufism. Ruzbihan Bakli, Fark Tasavvuf in the Sufi Tejrubesi, Ve Velayat Belagati. Sufism, an introduction to the mystical tradition of Islam, Doktan Yedide Ve 2011'de Iki Baskısı, 
yapılmış olan kitap, İslam'ın mistik geleneği tasavvufa giriş. Ruzbihan Bakli, The Unveiling of Secrets, Diary of a Sufi Master. Ruzbihan Bakli, Sırların İfşası, Bir Mürşidin Günlüğü, Vakıası. Teachings of Sufism, Tasavvuf Öğretileri. Professor Bruce Professor Lawrence, with Professor Bruce Lawrence, uh, they co-authored uh, Sufi Martyrs uh, of Law. Aşkın Sufi Şehitleri, Güney Asya ve Ötesinde Çiştiği Tasavvufu, Professor Richard Martin ile beraber Professor Richard Martin, they edited Orientalism to Cosmopolitanism, İslam Çalışmalarını Yeniden Düşünmek, Orientalizmden Cosmopolitanizme, how to read the Quran, a new guide with select translations, Quran'ı nasıl okumalı, seçilmiş tercümelerle yeni bir rehber, Islamophobia in America, the anatomy of intolerance, Amerika'da İslamophobia, tahammülsüzlüğün anatomisi adıyla derlediği pek çok kitabı var. And many other books uh, he uh, edited. Uh, yesterday on July the 15th, uh, Hüseyin ibn, Hüseyin ibn Mansur, who was uh, martyrized, and his uh, 117 uh, poems, poems of a Sufi martyr, uh, Hallaj, uh, book uh, was uh, published yesterday. This book at Northwestern University uh, was awarded uh, with an uh, award of uh, translation. Congratulations, uh, Professor. Uh, professor talks about uh, the Islamic uh, studies uh, and the Islamic studies should be evaluated in line with relig religious studies in uh, general. And uh, at many American universities, uh, he uh, helped a lot for the structuring of uh, Sufi studies. For about 40 years, uh, he uh, has been uh, dealing with basic uh, and critical problems in the field of Islamic studies, criticism about Sufism, and and spiritual and moral life uh, traditions are of his uh, subject of uh, studies. Humanitarian uh, sciences is important for uh, him, and as much as that, uh, he is uh, very much prudent and uh, meticulous uh, that these studies are read and studied by the others. Uh, so the balanced uh, uh, understanding of love and science uh, is what he uh, what uh, she uh, uh, concentrates on, and uh, Professor uh, James Morris, Boston at Boston College at the Department of uh, Theology. He is a faculty uh, member, was born in 1949, uh, completed his undergraduate studies uh, in uh, Chicago University and obtained his PhD degrees in 1980 uh, from Harvard University. The Hikmet of Kursi was the title of his dissertation in Boston and various other schools, universities. He delivered lectures uh, in the field of Islamic studies and religious studies, humanitarian Islamic sciences, uh, poetry, music, uh, Islam philosophy, Sufism, Hadith, uh, Quran, uh, and spiritual um, issues uh, are uh, his fields of uh, concentration. Some of his works are as follows. Orientation, Islamic thought in a world civilization isimli kitabı, yönelimler bir dünya medeniyetinde İslam düşüncesi ismiyle Türkçe'ye Profesör Mahmud Erol Kılıç hocamız tarafından kazandırılmıştır. Yakın zamanda Openings from the Quran and for about 40 years, <coughs> he has been uh, studying in the field of uh, Sufism and Islamic philosophy. Sufism, philosophy, Quran, poetry uh, are the uh, 
subject matters uh, he concentrates on and his studies uh, were breakthroughs. Uh, Dr. Nurullah Kortash, with his uh, translated uh, his uh, study. Uh, Nurullah uh, Hoja is here with us. Jim Mor uh, James Morris uh, works, uh, studies uh, the works of uh, many uh, distinguished uh, Sufis. And Morris also uh, says uh, every Sufi starts with uh, mysticism and uh, ends up with unexpected things. The late Professor Marshall Hudson at Chicago University uh, delivered lectures in the field of Islam philosophy at Chicago University, and thanks to him, he started to show interest in the field. And Anna Marie Shimel at Harvard University, the late Shimel, and in Iran, Eric Korban, and uh, Toshiko Izutsi, like scholars, uh, are of the scholars he uh, worked with, and he says uh, he, uh, the work uh, experience with them opened up horizons for him. At Uskudar University Institute for Sufi Studies, we are very much pleased and honored uh, to uh, have uh, our distinguished, estimable uh, scholars with us, uh, and we are very grateful here and uh, every uh, part of the world. Uh, they uh, are pr uh, present with their studies, and I would like to invite them all to the stage now. Today uh, is one of the happiest days of my life. Uh, since year 2000, we have been brothers and sisters, and I had strong faith, and I had extreme, deepest respect in Karl Ernst. He is my friend, and as well as his wife. He's my brother, so we are together with him. And on the other side, his dervishhood and his professorship is more or less the same level. And he gives the same value to his dervishhood and his professor. So we are together. Now, John Guzel actually uh, tried to uh, tell you how precious both are for us. I don't remember how long it has been, but in Malaysia, uh, it was the first Malaysian Tasaw Symposium, and we were together with Carl, especially in countries where Shariat is more dominant. Where, when we actually do seminars in Tasawuf and try to spread Tasawuf across the globe, this is a deeply precious value for us. So his presence is like a miracle for us. And they actually have no material concern about uh, this event. The only reason why they come is because they believe in the truth of Tasawuf, they believe in the goodness of Turkey, and they are always supporting us spiritually. So if there is a success, it actually comes out of union, unity. The only thing that actually makes people 
uh, or avoids people being enemies is actually love and togetherness. And the power that doesn't make us see the faults in others is again love and unity. So since 2000, we, are, we have been hand in hand. And inshallah, when the titics arrive, so I would like to actually apologize uh, after a while we will actually be seeing the Oscar awards or the Oscar winners of Tasawuf, truly. So I would like to really thank them from the depth of my heart. And um, inshallah, these will be continuing again and again. And the students in Boston College or in North Carolina, we will come more and more. And we also will be learning from them. And I'm hoping that they will also be coming, uh, going over interesting and different experience uh, in Turkey. Because in Turkey, as its nature, even though the Turkish people want it or not, there is an atmosphere of tasawuf fear. So the love for tasawuf, the joy in being together for tasawuf, will actually make us together. So we should actually be work together, and we will be successful with this unity. So on my back, I have those strong friends. And the university in North Carolina, the backstage, the preparation for it, may Allah be so content with them. I, I'm so happy. So I am actually a host today, so I would like to leave the floor to my friends now. Briefly, I would like to talk about the history of the Tasawuf Institute here. Uh, first of all, this summer, uh, on the 16th and 20th July, we have held for the first time in Turkey an international Tasawuf studies summer school. So this is the first time. And this program aims at actually spreading the knowledge of Tasawuf culture and analyzing the language in both Ottoman Turkish as well. So we actually have 136 students coming from so many different countries, Oman, China, Pakistan, Hindustan, Germany, India, South America, Canada, and England. So together with Carl Ernst, William Chittick, Sashiko Murata, James Morris, we will also be hosting, inshallah, Mohammed Rustam with, here as well. He is from Canada. He is an Islamic He's a professor of Islam. He, this is actually a great opportunity. So I would like to ask my friends to ask questions to our professors being present here. So because the professors here love questions, so you would be actually benefiting a lot from it. So there is also a methodology course. I think this is a common problem, because in Tasawuf studies, we don't have uh, any kind of a methodology here. So first, we should have faith and love, and then we should actually be leading towards research. So that's what our professors will be teaching us. So we will be having some selective texts from Tasawufi texts, and this is a great opportunity and chance for us because Carl will be showing us uh, a very special text. And Emine uh, Hoca is one of the most beloved teachers, so she will also be showing us some beautiful literature, literal texts. Uh, in 2016, Tasov Culture and uh, Language Masters program started. I would like to actually truly share with you a, a truth, because the Higher Council actually told us last year that they wouldn't actually allow us to be able to have a MA program with a thesis, but they did. So one can understand that this world is not ruled by yuk or politics or anything. It is ruled by the other world. So if God wants, everything happens. 
now we have 120 students in master's program. Uh, there are people who have uh, graduated from the program without a dissertation. And uh, inshallah, at the end of this academic year, they will be uh, graduating with their dissertations this semester. And um, a person from higher Education once asked me, now you actually graduate students here, but how much will they actually be earning? But now I look at my friends, they don't focus on how much money to earn, they just give money to us. The only important thing is to learn for them, so they will be learning a lot from their teachers today. So full-time we have four teachers, full-time teachers, Emine. Professor Emine, Can Güzel Eylül, and Niazi Hoca. And we have part-time teachers, three of them, Mohammed Bidirhan, and a very precious Tuba Hoca, and a very precious, precious friend of mine, Dilek Güldutuna. Zeynep Akai is one of the most beloved Arabic teacher. I was actually sort of afraid of my students somehow, but they ended up being in love with Arabic. Uh, we also have introduction to Islamic uh, history. I would also like to remind you that it's very easy to be able to a student in this department. But it's not that easy to be able to graduate, to be able to leave this school, because you have to be equipped with very deeper and inner meaning, not only in the field of tasawuf, but al also in the field of divinity. So that's how our students are uh, studying. Niazi Beki, Professor Niazi Beki, uh, teaches tafsir and hadith. So he actually both teaches the text, and he also teaches by living and by practicing. Rıdvan Özdilek gives us Kelam seminars from Istanbul University. Sümeyye Parıldar gives us lectures, again from Istanbul University on Islamic philosophy. Mansur Kocika teaches us seminars of Islamic law. So in the curriculum, Tasawuf and the history of religions will be taught by our teachers who are present here. Uh, Bruce Lawrence, Miriam Cook uh, on, uh, on a program of 42 hours. They will also be giving us courses. Bruce uh, was with us. Everybody loved him so much. Uh, and there will be four open to public seminars, Berzah in Tasawuf, the novels in Tasawuf, Divine Names, and Sainthood. So the selective courses is Introduction to Ibn Arabi Thought. And for the last three semesters, we have been actually giving those courses. Mahmoud Erol Kılıç is actually giving those courses on Ibn Arabi Thought. One of the compulsory courses is Tasawuf, culture, Sufi culture, which is coordinated by Zülf Zülfikar, Can Güzel Zülfikar, Ercan Alkan, Güngür Yazıcı, Yağmur Tunalı, Hakan Alvan, Çiçek Derman, and Bahatanman. Ahmet Güler Sayar, Savaş Berçkin Nurullah Kortaç, and Nurhan Atasoy. And this is also a blessing for us because we are actually talking about how intensely we and how delicately we um, examine Tasawuf with all its delicate sides. So the, we have done, uh, for the first time, master student seminar. So Germany, America, Japan, Lebanon, Malaysia, and from Turkey, we had 61 presentations. And the ones from Turkey have also been invited by most universities in Turkey, especially regarding economy and tasawuf, or uh, the presentations regarding the good manners in business life, ahlak in business life. So one can understand that tasawuf is actually a multi-sided living style.
So in every field of your life, if you do not leave Tasawwuf, you cannot become a real Muslim. I was actually reading uh, a book of Samiha Aiverdi, uh, where she said the important thing is not actually knowing a lot, but living it. So just like Mevlana, we should actually know the knowledge, and but also be able to uh, become an example of people in the world. It's one of the very important things here as well uh, is that we have engineers, economists, and they somehow combine their knowledge from their fields and they integrate it into the field of tasawwuf. And so we are a group of people who are trying to practice tasawwuf both in their uh, business lives and in their social lives. Kenan Arifai, Islamic research professor Juliana Jammer, Hammer and Chinese Art Halil was also with us as well. In 2015, we have we started with 70 students. That was actually the first time when we were asking people from outside and inviting us to join, but now we don't need to do that because there is abundance of people applying. In spring semester, we have education seminars, introduction to Tasawuf, Tasawuf universe and Insan. So we are following Jili's Insan Kamil book, The Perfected Human Being. And we are also trying to understand myself as well as teaching Insani Kamil. I'm act I've actually learned from uh, our teacher over here uh, on how to teach Tasawu through s movies. And every Sunday, we've had lessons of movies and Tasawuf. So we've from Germany, from America, we have students following us online, so we have our distant program as well. Uh, from the presidency as well, we have organized a joint seminar with Kyoto University and Üsküdar University, the Bridge of Two Easts. Ibn Arabi, one of the best e examples of Ibn Arabi's uh, commentaries is Izutsu. And Kyoto University is actually supported by Izutsu as well. So Allah actually blessed us to be able to work with Kyoto University. Five students, five master students from Kyoto University uh, who know actually Turkish and Ottoman Turkish, they came to Turkey. They actually uh, improved their Ottoman Turkish with Emine Hoca and they were so happy and they said they would actually want uh, to be able to students of Emine Yeni Terzi till the end of their lives. And we also had a symposium in Kyoto about the methodology in Tasawwuf studies. From Japan and from Turkey we have had 30 presentations in the symposium entitled The Bridge of Two Easts. We've had a special opening and closing a remarks session. Carl Ernst, William Chittix, Juliana Hammer, Omid Safi, Bruce Lawrence, Miriam Cook, and researchers from Japan. The Asian case studies were one of the focuses there. So we actually uh, share the view of definitely changing the methodological ways in Tasawuf research. I have been suffering from a severe disease, thank to God, this year. After all those uh, things we have been successful, I was thinking that perhaps my job is over now, but now I see that every day I am assigned with a new task. But every day Allah's new Jema Nusargut's or new James Morris's, new um, Carl Ernst will come. The greatness of Allah or the success of these beautiful scholars will also be continuing. And 
I'm hoping that Tasawuf will be actually integrating with the other fields in our institute. I think this is a revolution, and this will only be understood in ages to come. And the mission does not belong to me, as Elif said. It belongs to Kenan Arifai. In 1920s, he once said to us that one day, Tasawuf will be taught in academia. And he said that if I were to live in those days, I wouldn't be a sheikh, I would be a professor. So I would like to thank my Allah, my God, to be able to have the blessing to be here. So I love my Allah, I love my Prophet, and I am joyfully waiting for the moment to be in the presence of Allah. Thank you so much. Well, uh, it's a great honor and uh, personal pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to express my thanks to my very dear friend, Jamal Nurasargo, who is sitting next to me, and to all of the people who have made this program possible. I am looking out and seeing uh, remarkable number of people here uh, who have come from many different places and so uh, your quest is important and your energy will help to make this uh, an experience that will be memorable. And uh, I'm also glad to be on the platform with my very good friend, Jim Morris. We've known each other for many years since we were in graduate school together back in uh, the ancient days. And uh, we often meet here at this uh, crossroads of, uh, of the world. And uh, our friends who are still on the way uh, Bill Chidik, Sachiko Murata, Mohammed Rustam, who's been a more recent um, addition. Uh, I, I think we'll have a fascinating series of presentations. So um, I have a few remarks to make. Uh, will I take about 15 minutes, or how long would, would be appropriate? OK. Whatever you want. Simply to give you a, a little advanced taste of what I'm planning to discuss in the next few days. Uh, the term methodology has been mentioned, and I feel it is my responsibility at this event to make things more complicated. And uh, by that, I mean to say that we are in a university, and the academic study of Sufism is not the same as being a Sufi. You don't have to be in a university to be a, a Sufi. What you have to do to be in a university is to be a student. And you have to have questions. So I want to spend a little time talking about questions and where they come from. You see, every year I get inquiries from people around the world who are interested in studying for a PhD and who wish to do something in relation to the study of Sufism. And they will typically say, I want to read Rumi, or I want to study Ibn Arabi, or something like that. And I have the very strong feeling that with most of them, the feeling is that it's just me and Rumi. 
It's just me and Ibn Arabi. No one else has ever thought about this before. It's not enough to have a text. It's not enough to have one name or a figure that you're attached to. To be a scholar, you have to have a question. And the questions come from the academic discipline. So when I write back to these students, I will ask them, what is your question? If you're going to read Ibn Arabi, Will you put this into a literary framework? Will you ask questions that come from philosophy, from ethics? There is a large amount of scholarship out there, and you have to know it. You have to be able to match the contributions of those who have come before, and you have to know the terminology and have the ability to use it intelligently. I'm going to go into this in detail with some examples uh, during the week. But I'm going to, I have a, my students are very familiar with my habit of asking about the history of words. Because words do not grow on trees. They have been introduced at certain times and places for particular purposes, and they change over time. And some words are contested, which means to say that people do not agree what they mean. If you go into the United States today and ask, what is a liberal? Some people will say, do you mean liberal or do you mean American? <laughs> Some people uh, think it, liberal means uh, freedom and uh, noble ideals. Other people think it means leftist nonsense. And the same thing is true. We have a very complicated situation with uh, Tasawwuf and the word which is most often used to translate it into English, which is Sufism. Now I'm going to speak about this at greater length later on. Please notice, Sufism has an ism on the end. This is an English word which originates from the Enlightenment project of the 18th century which attempted to catalog everything in the world. And ideologies were given the names of isms. And from a very deeply spiritual and ethical concept, we have something that becomes increasingly identified as a social movement. So I'm just going to give you one example. In the early Sufi writings, the term itself, Sufi, is used in very particular ways. So for instance, Abul Hassan al-Nuri said, the Sufi prefers others to himself. The Sufi prefers others to himself. What social group is described by this characteristic? It's not an ethnic term. It's not a class term. It's not a linguistic term. It's something that we can only imagine. But we can imagine it. We can imagine this ethical quality that goes beyond selfishness of the ego. But this is not the modern notion of a religious movement in which people are interested in the numbers. So I think it's important for us to know the history of these words. And I will spend a little time this next week talking about 
the Europeans who first began to describe the figures that we, they called dervishes, whom they often regarded with contempt and hostility. And then the scholars in the British East India Company in the late 1700s, like Sir William Jones, who invented the term Sufism, what did they mean and what has been the result of their theories and their writings? We need to know this history because if you don't know the history of words and the different meanings they have been given, you're not in control of your own argument. So that is about the origins of Orientalism and, uh, and categories and so forth. I'm going to ask people to consider arguments of scholars who approach the study of Sufism from very different points of view. Should we, how should we deal with the difference between the insider and the outsider? Do we simply replicate what the insider statement is about a particular religious group or doctrine? Do we need to compare it to other examples? Do we need to give it a classification? Whose classification should we use? If we simply repeat what is said in a social context, that is not a theoretical reflection. A theoretical reflection brings into play categories that have to be understood analytically or redefined. Some of the categories that we have received are problematic. The so wolf is sometimes described as mysticism. I find that my students do not understand this word at all. They think that mysticism means magic. And when I ask them for an example of a mystic, the name that they commonly tell me is Nostradamus, the obscure French writer who predicted the future in verses of cryptic obscurity. I'm going to ask people to help me uh, look at the way the Oxford English Dictionary describes the two different origins of the term mysticism. The term appears for the first time in the 1700s in totally opposite ways. On the one hand, it is described as an obscure, irrational view of things that is related to the ma magic. On the other hand, it is described as a teaching about the divine attributes and the mysteries which cannot be understood by reason. So the first definition of mysticism is very negative, and the second one is very positive, but they both came into existence at the same time. So is this a term that we can use with confidence? Do we need to debate it? Do we need to redefine it? These are some of the questions that we'll have to face. So I will also ask people to consider difficult examples, hard to classify questions. Why, do, why am I going to do something like this? I think we should remember that our colleagues in the natural sciences will achieve their greatest success not 
by imitating and praising the efforts of the past, but by showing new ideas that change our understanding of nature. So there are examples that will be hard to classify, and that is where I find that there is much to be done of creative scholarly work. The things that don't fit. If there are examples that don't fit into the current theories, then we need to make the theories more sophisticated and able to ac account for these examples. So um, I'll give you a few examples very briefly. Let us consider the question of the Sufi tariqa or silsile, or uh, what we commonly call it in English, a Sufi order. This is a social institution. It is an organization of masters and disciples. They have histories, lineages, teachings, practices. They are known by names like the Mevlevi, the Rafai, and so forth. There was a time when there were no Sufi orders. In the early centuries of Islamic civilization, there were much more informal groups of people who were not formally organized in the same way that the tariqas were in later times. So the early Sufis did not have tariqas in the same way as after the establishment of these big organizations. And in the 20th century, some things have changed dramatically. Here in Turkey, the abolition of the Sufi orders in 1925 by the uh, policy of nationalization, secularism, made for a big change. So in other words, the Tariqa has not been a constant defining factor of what it means to be involved in Sufism. And this is not a surprise because we're talking about history. In history, there will be changes. And when there is change, history does not have an essence. We have to know history to know what is happening in a particular moment, what are the conditions, and what are the events that have contributed to the distinctive character of those moments. After all, during the time when Rumi and Ibn Arabi were living, there were very particular events like the Mongol invasions, the Crusades, just to mention a couple of important ones. And so uh, for people in a different time, they will have different challenges and different opportunities. The reason I mention this example, though, is to explain how sometimes this can be the, the notion of a textbook definition can be taken to an extreme. I recently wrote uh, a response to a series of articles about modern Sufism in the modern era. And uh, one of the cases that was being discussed was in India, where there was a sheikh who died in about 1870, so 150 years ago. He was very well known. His name was Varis Ali Shah. And he lived in a place called Deva Sharif. After he died, this is in British India, under British colonial rule, his family came and said, well, we are the ones who inherit the property of the sheikh, including his tomb. 
which was a place that already was being visited by many people. So the case came to a British judge. And the British judge said, well, uh, there's a problem here. This sheikh does not appear to belong to any particular tariqah. And not only that, he has accepted followers who are not Muslims. So he cannot be a real Sufi, because I have read that you have to have a tariqah, and you, you have to be a Muslim to be attached to this. So the family did not receive the inheritance, and the colonial court had its decision. Now, you might have one opinion about this case or another opinion, but there is something unusual about a British judge deciding whether or not this sheikh was a true Sufi on the basis of a definition that he had read about in some textbook. So there is a, a social reality that we have to account for and there are theories that are in the books and how will you decide when they do not agree? And there are other examples of this. For instance, you know, uh, there is a wonderful kind of literature um, for Sufis, which are books of adab, books of admirable behavior. And they also include uh, descriptions of the things you should not do. Now, human nature is consistent on this point. If there is a rule against something, then you know somebody was doing that. <laughs> so the fact that a rule had to be introduced means that people were doing something which was then decided was a bad thing and it needed to be prohibited. So we can read these books of Adab in more than one way. And uh, I mean, th some of these examples are per peculiar, but I remember reading about one sheikh. There was one rule that said, you should not, if you are in Sama, if you are listening to music, you should not roll on the floor. And then it mentions that sheikh so-and-so used to roll on the floor all the time, and now we're going to put a stop to that. <laughs> so, um, those are a few examples of things that are a little bit harder to classify. Um, I'll mention a few others, uh, some of which are kind of political. And there are interesting figures like the Qalandars, the Abdals, the Haidaris, the Malangs, the Jalalis. Are we considering these to be the same category as the sheikhs of the Naqshbandi, the Mevlavi, etc.? Are there any people that you would like to remove from the category of the Sufi uh, who happen to wear a lot of metal chains and shave their heads and act in a strange manner? That's a question to consider. And um, I would also like to talk a little bit about uh, ethnographic research which, again, is more about the practice of religion than the text. I'm going to mention a number of examples of, of work which is very professional, which is done by anthropologists, sometimes who spend years basically observing and asking questions. And what they describe is not always what you expect from the text. So one example I will mention is there was a sheikh in India who was uh, very prominent from his social position, but his wife was the healer. 
She was the one that people came to see. So there's an interesting social effect going on here because the man has the official position, but the woman is doing the work. <laughs> so I think you might like to know more about that woman. Well, we have a very good book about this. Uh, and uh, I have advised some uh, PhD students who have had some exceptional experiences, and I, I will give you some examples of those. But it is, uh, these are oftentimes unexpected things will happen that you cannot control. And uh, when dealing with living people, if you write about them, they may be disappointed in what you say. Because if you describe a, uh, the practices of a living group without simply admiring them, people may feel you're being critical or you have some attitude that is uh, not entirely friendly. So there will always be some distance between the academic and the, and the subject of religious life. They cannot be exactly identical. Last couple of examples I give, and I, I probably won't have time this week to get to all of them, but I've done a lot of work on a particular problem, which is the history of Sufi engagement with the practices of yoga. So you're asking me, what are you talking about? And I have to tell you that my first trip to Istanbul, which was in 1990, I came to visit the Suleymaniye to look at manuscripts on yoga, which are in the Suleymaniye library. Uh, there is one particular text. There are at least 80 manuscripts known of the Arabic version. Half of them are said to be by Ibn Arabi. They're not. But that helped to make them popular. And it was translated into Turkish by a sheikh named Salahi Efendi in the 18th century. And I found copies in the Suleymaniye and in Istanbul University of the Turkish translation that were written down in the 1890s and after 1900, in which you have the names of Hindu goddesses being recited in uh, mantra form, and we know that Mevlevis were using these texts. So what is that about? Uh, that's a fascinating problem. And uh, if I have time, I'll tell you more examples of this. And uh, then the last thing that, that I think will be interesting would be to consider the problems of the globalization of Sufism what happens when uh, people are listening to something called Sufi music? What is the nature of their engagement with the Sufi tradition? Uh, there are large groups in America and Europe that are called Sufi that are not particularly Islamic. Some people would object to that. But how do we deal with it as a phenomenon that we can understand? So I promised you that I would make things more complicated. Uh, it's sometimes been said that professors are supposed to make the familiar strange and make the strange familiar. This all means that we want to understand the reality of our lives in ways that are more complex in a good way, that take us to a higher understanding of our humanity, and hopefully in a way that will enhance the future of our relations. The real importance of all of this 
is to make it possible for people to understand those from different cultures. That's the project that I'm working on, and I look forward to working with you on that in the next week. Uh, welcome to this huge crowd. I hope we won't see as many people in our individual classes or I'll be overwhelmed. <laughs> I uh, will have to lecture and speak all the time, whereas uh, the best seminars are always the ones where I say the less and have the most to hear from from the rest of the groups. I, I think I'll follow, uh, perhaps in less detail, but basically in Carl's footsteps in talking about the two courses that I was asked to do. Um, in both cases, all of the reading materials are available on, did you just, Dropbox? I, and will be after it's over, so there's more there than we can read and study and work on together in two weeks. But if there's anyone who's signed up and doesn't have access to that, Please see John Guzel Hoja or someone else who probably does have that on your computer. Uh, one course, and that's I'll very very brief about that. I, I was it's listed as Sufi texts in English, but I was told it would be Sufi texts in Arabic, and that would be the course on chapters 50 to 58. The courses on ilham and spiritual discernment and inspiration uh, uh, from the very individual point of view is the very heart of uh, spiritual practice and the spiritual path uh, in Sufism. It's a very universal uh, approach to things, but as usual in Ibn Arabi, it's not challenging reading. So I thought it would be good practice. Uh, I fortunately have a couple of those chapters available in English. Probably the first session will start out with chapter 54. I'll translate the bits that aren't into the article there, and uh, we'll have to see where people's Arabic is and whether there's actually a significant enough group to kind of have a whole, whole uh, core group who can um, read some of the uh, texts and then everyone else can listen in who comes. But again, uh, we'll have to see what size room we have, if we can meet in a circle. All those uh, practicalities have yet to be resolved. And if we have uh, 20 or 30 people, that will probably work. If we have more than that, it'll be a end up being my discussing English <laughs> translations, probably. So, But that, that course, at least, will be done much like any uh, graduate seminar would be uh, pretty much anywhere in the world with uh, discussing the text and having everybody do their individual contribution as we go along. Now, the general course, I understood, would probably be a very diverse audience of uh, many backgrounds and ages and levels of experience. And I thought, um, well, as Carl alluded to, we've, we've been at this uh, quest for some 50 years, uh, Zahran, in the outside world, probably a lot longer than that in other dimensions. And so we've accumulated a certain kind of, uh, well, I, I don't want to say wisdom, just practical experience from the process of teaching different audiences in different countries. I've taught almost as much of my life abroad in France and England, as for example, as I many Muslim countries as I have in the United States. So one thing I, I would say is that uh, what you learn over time, if you're a good student, you, you get all the words, to use Carl's saying, you get the words, ideas, general ideas, and so forth. Uh, you're inculcated with those very early on. But what do you do with the next 40, 50 years of your life? What does it mean to practice a path? What does it mean to be on a path and whatever? Well, my own sense of it is things get deeper, not wider. but it's the difference between what the Sufis call ilm, uh, not the Quranic sense of ilm, because that's ma'rifah, but, but what they call kind of outward knowing or learning, adab, rules, and so forth, uh, the contrast between that and ma'rifah, which is the awareness uh, that we already have uh, of the divine in this life in which we carry on with us into higher levels of existence. So. How do you do that? How do you evo evoke that? And I've often found over time that uh, one way of communicating with people, groups of people from any background, uh, is to find certain masterpieces of Sufi teaching that uh, take the form of modern films uh, with the help of uh, 
Yekta and others here, I found at least three films that shouldn't offend anyone. Uh, and since I wasn't sure, I think they will be available. Uh, the first one is uh, Rango Khoda, The Color of Paradise, Majidi's film for Thursday. With the help of uh, uh, other people here, I hope that we can find those films both in Turkish and in subtitled in English so that everyone can see them and we can talk about them. The reason masterpiece films work so well is the same reason that the Masnavi stands out above everything else, really, or the certain books of Malfuzat. First of all, they are the quintessence of spiritual teaching and experience. But above all, they allow people to tap into their own deepest level of experience and understanding, but without having to say publicly, that's me, without having to speak in, uh, as with the egoistic I. So you can talk about what's up there on the screen, and everybody knows very well you're talking about yourself, but it's a lot easier for students to talk about characters in a play or these days in the film than it is, or in a story in Sufi terms. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the person who isn't here today, but some of you know her, uh, Roe Holbrook, uh, Victoria Holbrook, who is a long, another one of our longtime colleagues who, in her case, spent most of her formative years right here in Istanbul, translated Kanan Rafai's commentary in the Masavi. Well, we were living and teaching in Paris in England at that time, and she came for the summer to stay nearby. And I saw a really moving film um, that was uh, uh, it's not really called Subway. It doesn't really matter with Isabella Johnny. But the music at the end was absolutely extraordinary. And I said, boy, somebody could see this movie, and the words wouldn't matter. But the music and the way it worked at the end of the film left such a powerful and transforming tradition. Work better? Too close to the mic? Okay. No, it's not better now. <laughs> and uh, Rose, some of you may know her dad's a very, very, very famous actor. Uh, she, uh, she said, uh, when I made that remark, she said, Are you crazy? Don't you know that if Rumi were around today, he'd be a rock star? <laughs> and for me, that was a life-changing situation because I was a very good student in the academic sense, and I had these like secret, subversive ideas that this might be far more widespread and more real to human beings than just the, the historical groups that Carl has talked about. But it was kind of a license. Also, there's something about having babies around that sort of opens you up to a larger spiritual world. I just had a new baby at that time. But I really have her to thank for kind of crystallizing that awareness, which I was later uh, constantly able to bring to my teaching, not only about Islam and Sufism, about many other religious and philosophic traditions as well. So by way of transfer of preparation for that course, I have three articles up there that I think at least would help. Just, they're not, we're not gonna talk about them, but they're there as general background. And one is, uh, it's called Ibn Arabi's short course in love. It's, Basically, he's uh, viewing the whole world as Hawa in all of its different forms. Not in the pejorative sense, the Arabic often takes on popular usage, but as Eros in all its dimensions is in Plato's Symposium. So that's a very good article to uh, sort of understand the ways in which, as uh, Jamal Nurhoja just said at the beginning, that, that love is the very basis of this path. Uh, but to see it in all of its dimensions, very short, uh, graspable uh, treatment of the subject. The second is an article on calling and response, uh, again, from chapters in the Futuhat, but above all, the importance there is to see how, from the point of view of the Quran, how central this notion is, both of our calling upon God and of God's calling upon us, because the path really comes down to, and this is why it's a path that every human being has to take, this constant interplay of the real calling upon us and our responding or of our it uh, doesn't matter what you believe in. People are constantly calling upon something or for something larger than themselves. And they do witness the response, again, quite unrelated to what beliefs they might have or not have. So that Quranic background is very nicely summarized in those translated passages in that article. The third article is, I think it's called Contemplation and Spiritual Virtues. It, it doesn't matter, it's listed there. The, but it's really what's interesting 
For those of you who don't have a deep background in the Quran, is it's a listing of the key spiritual virtues in the Quran. At the end, it's an appendix uh, with the kind of adequate English translation or approximation, because none of them have equivalents in English that really work. And uh, in order of their frequency of their being mentioned in the Quran. And here again, since the path is all about faith, iman, and el, uh, as we discover it and manifest it in the challenges or tests that our life consists of here in this planet, it's good to have those, uh, all of those different spiritual virtues in mind just as a common ground for our further discussion. So um, the, uh, the, the uh, because I wasn't sure about having three of the three films I wanted to use for the last three classes, I've added some readings for each one. A uh, beautiful story at the end of Atar's Conference of the Birds, which is the end and not the story where the birds encounter each other, but the one that comes after that, which is a very challenging tale. And then the, um, I forget what the third one is, but the last one, which I would urge you to start reading now, is I took the uh, first story of the king and the handmaiden from the Masnavi, uh, the story that bridges the third and fourth books of the reset button, just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar and at home with the Masnavi, uh, in the first three books, uh, Rumi talks about the path and things where ways we're often used to it, a series of teachings, ideal models, ways that you can act in which, uh, if you, you give the idea, sort of you follow these kinds of actions and all, you'll, you'll get there. It'll, you'll get there. And he has this wonderful story of sort of this high achieving uh, Sufi of Central Asia. And then suddenly he pushes the button the reset button and says, but here's the model of the, the very essence of our individual state. And our individual state turns out to be this hypocrite who sort of love struck for a beautiful princess behind the walls and who only uh, gets the courage to speak to her because he's chased over the walls by the police. Um, and, and in fact, he's, uh, he, he, some of the sections are, uh, a little risque, I've left those out of the past, of the parts I left there. But basically, if that's the model of our, or the essence of our essential state, it kind of calls into question the kind of ways that with our minds we can convince ourselves that we're Sufis, that we're on the path, that we're perfect and all, whereas in fact we're always in, in God's hands, and it's usually what we have the highest ideas of ourself that the worst tests overtake us. And then it's almost at the end, uh, People don't read that much books five and six of the Masnavi uh, for the same reason they don't ever read Dante's Paradiso. Everybody knows the Inferno because we live in it. But, um, <laughs> and purgatory, if we're on the spiritual path, we, we experience purgatory, helpfully, almost every day. But paradise is something very far away from our experience. Likewise, books five and six of the Masnavi, you get the sense that Rumi's writing almost every page as though he's not sure he'll finish it, but he wants to get the essence of what he's learned from life in those pages. And there's a beautiful story there at the end about three princes who were sent out by their father to go out and to order the world and their lives, what every parent wants their sons to do. Uh, you can't help but imagine being the uh, counterpart of the initial story that there's almost like the, children, the sons of the king and they had made at the beginning certainly wants to suggest that to us. And they head off to China where, and the only ar argument he gives them is uh, only or order he gives them, this comes back to what uh, Carl said about Adam earlier, is don't go near the palace of the king of China and above all, have nothing to do with his daughter. <laughs> And of course, they decide that's exactly what they're going to do. <laughs> it's like, don't touch the tree in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> he knew very well what he was doing, <laughs> telling him not to do it. But uh, their three lives and their three interactions become kind of epitomes of three different ways we can live the spiritual path. And you have this great irony that the ways of devotion, of ish, of uh, knowledge of Elm uh, are dead ends. They literally die before they can complete those tunes. But it's the person who is the laziest, the, uh, the sabr tawakul, who practices the harder, hardest of the spiritual virtues. He's the one who carries off the prize at the end. 
So um, the films are adequate. Uh, we'll have plenty to talk about. But even if you, if you have the time at all, do read the things from Attar and uh, uh, Rumi there. One of the things that uh, I know, I've met a number of people here in communications and psychology. Maybe that's just because those are the departments in this building. One of the things you discover when you spend some time with different literatures, or for that matter, different uh, oral teachings uh, about things called Sufism, is that um, the range of rhetoric and languages and teaching methods is, is close to unlimited, and it's constantly evolving. Again, Carl alluded to that a little bit. And one of the things that really stands out if you have to teach these things over decades is that there are very few people who write in such a way that every audience can understand them and that they mean for their writings to be understood. By every audience, I mean not just Muslims, not just Sufis, but human beings, quite human beings. In other words, their writings will be around a thousand years from now, maybe translated, adapted a little bit. There aren't many of those people, but Ibn Arabi and Rumi, who lived at the same time, and Attar, who inspired them, and above all, Hafez, who kind of integrated everything, Hafez of Shiraz. These are writers that uh, will be part of the global civilization that we're all in the process of uh, constructing. So after you've got a degree in Sufi studies, what do you do with it? Uh, well, you'll find different ways of coping with that on a practical level. But one of the things that it should help to prepare all of us to do is to communicate in ways that, uh, again, I'm only paraphrasing and expanding what Janal Dor said at the very beginning, communicate in ways that bring people together for their highest purpose. And today, that means uh, speaking across languages, speaking across cultures, speaking across boundaries, which were once very strict. But you go back through history, and you find there are many other periods where those boundaries melted. Uh, India is one of those places that Carl mentioned that certainly that happened many other times. The uh, period of the Neoplatonist and Hellenic civilization right here in this part of the world was another. So. Um, if nothing else, we should learn not only about some Sufi writers and filmmakers, but also about the practice of Ihsan. And uh, what I've tried to do here uh, in this general class is to kind of suggest tools that we can use, Ihsan being the culmination of our faith and our practice, uh, that Ihsan, uh, as it says in the prophets, were uh, to worship and serve God as though you see who, not, not a him, but a, that reality. And if you are not, then you do see him. So if the practice is all about becoming not, about Nisti, uh, the task that we have is not to consume Sufism, but to producing something else that, it's, uh, that is um, the reality, the reality, what the prophet was actually teaching, what the, his response to Gabriel was, what is this on? It, and, a key element of Ihsan is that it's what's beautiful as well as what's good. And if there's any one thing in people's writing about Sufism that bothers me, it's the Sufism in practice is all about beauty, adab, adab, beauty and language. It's, it's what people automatically, whatever their background, fall in love with. And yet it's often neglected where Sufism is presented as a set of rules or practices without the beauty. Uh, being there, so I'm going to start with a picture and some music uh, tomorrow that will help to uh, stay with us throughout the throughout the other three sessions. Um, one, yeah, yeah. I. The other thing I just wanted to say is, uh, what do they call people who call themselves Su Sufis at first? They didn't use the word Sufi, as as Carl said. They called themselves fukara, and that meant maybe poor people, but certainly fakirun illallah, people who really aware of their need for their teacher with a capital T, even before they recognize their master and guide in this life. And um, you know, so we all uh, again something is maybe embarrassing to mention in groups, but we all are constantly learning to become children again in the path. That's the way the path works. I might even mention this anecdote, but it comes to me again when I, I've had, a lot of my teaching has come from my kids in various ways. 
balahasana and other kinds of bala. But um, my uh, youngest son, when he was five, was going through divorce and very upset about it. I remember uh, just taking him on a little walk. And I said, your middle name is uh, Samuel. Uh, and I says, and, and your name means, I don't know why I was saying this, but it means he listens to God, Samuel, the same root, Hebrew, Arabic, same root. And he said, Dad, very seriously, he said, Dad, I don't listen. I communicate. And he kept hitting his chest right here at his heart. And uh, Sufism is dead and always was dead unless we keep learning to communicate and to open our heart in the sense that this five-year-old was teaching me. So I look forward to communicating with all of you. Thank you. I'm speechless. I'm no words to say. It was such a blessing. One can truly understand this again. Uh, our professor actually explained how Tasawuf in terms of its history. I've heard something very interesting actually from you. That was something that I heard from Kenan Arifai. He once said, we went to a sheikh, but the real sheikh was actually his wife, and nobody understood that. Now, actually, uh, I would like to rem remind you of Ibn Arabi saying, you always see the imam in front of you, but there is actually the true imam that is controlling that very imam, but you are not aware of it. So we should be actually able to feel what God is telling us through these courses. This is such an important thing because it is the love towards Allah and this is to be in progress with Allah. Then all these sufferings become a pleasure and it's only when people can gather, can unite. And there is just one thing that Allah recommends us beautifully do not feel angry don't because there, there is nothing wrong there is nothing nonsense there is a very important advice of Carl to me uh, that really showed me the way we actually worship not God but the paths that's the source of the problem if we actually worship really God, Allah, then we see the divine names in people. So whatever we see in people, we think that everything is needed. Everybody is needed. If you give permission for me to tell you a story, I would like to share it with you. Uh, once a student asked, I understand everything, my sheikh, but why is these little bugs, those little big bugs full of microbes around us? Uh, this is a story that belongs to Mibala. And then the sheikh, that, that person, then has a spot on his uh, bottom. And then people go to the doctors and they say, you have to find five the ugly black bugs. Crush them and put them as a cream on your spot. And then he gets healed. And there is another... Uh, anecdote there is uh, uh, <laughs> there now that person actually then goes on board on a ship and there is a hurricane and people say why don't you pray and that very man said how can I pray once I interfered with this business and now I will not so tasawuf is actually true acceptance and that's what our teachers are also saying Thank you very much. Uh, çok teşekkür ederiz. Sayın Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Hoca. Dear Professor Doctor, the founding rector of our university will be with us. And then we would like to take a, a photograph all together afterwards. I would like to say welcome to our dear distinguished 
guests. I was able to actually attend uh, in the last half of the, the second half of the symposium, but it's still a pleasure for me. Uh, that came to mind to my mind in Harvard's university's website. There is a. 500 code uh, university course that focuses on um, positive psychology, which actually opened a new horizon in the history of Harvard history. The positive history, the positive psychology's toolkits are actually uh, with me at the same time, and the topics dealt with are like taken from ancient culture, like taken from Rumi, so, and they are uh, offered as a lecture under the name of positive uh, psychology. I said they're actually stealing role from Rumi, because this is not only Mevlana's property, this is the humanity's property. Uh, so Mevlana and Sufism actually told us these truths about positive psychology, but then it's like a diamond full of uh, mud around, which is now newly discovered or rediscovered by Harvard. This is the property of all humanity. So my beloved guests, I would uh, like to thank them for coming here uh, for discovering such truths and sharing those truths with us. They will be our guests for two weeks, and this is such a great honor for all of us. And I do believe that everybody will be greatly benefiting from their experiences. And I would also like to extend my thanks to Jamal Nurhoja and uh, her students. We are extremely delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much again.